This spring, mining giant Glencore chose Lifecycle as its partner in the battery recycling industry. Canal Falfer is Chief Strategy Officer at Lifecycle. Canal, welcome back to Kiko. Yep, thanks for having me again, Michael. It's uh, been some time. Let's go right to demand. Uh, EVs have caught on, but there is nowhere near the mass adoption. Explain why there's a need for recycling now, Canal. Yeah, so uh, recycling doesn't just cover end of life batteries. There's there's many points when when we're talking about EVs where the, the EV may have something wrong with it, recalls, etc., where there is a need for recycling, but also in the production of batteries. Um, there's a fair amount of scrap generated. And that's that's material that maybe doesn't pass the quality process or is just uh, what they call cut off. So part of the manufacturing process, which is unavoidable, where there'll be material with high nickel and cobalt content that can be recycled and, and repurposed. So there is already a need for recycling and, and that need is just going to grow. Catch us up, Canal. Um, Lifecycle has been raising a lot of money. The headline number was 100 million from Coke Industries last year. You're doing this big build out at Lifecycle. Explain the strategy. Yeah, so uh, I mean, the the strategy continues to be um, initially focused on North America. So we've built a number of our spokes or our shredding facilities, um, and and the big project, of course, is is the hub, which will refine intermediate products into battery grade materials become a major supplier of battery grade cobalt, nickel, and lithium in North America. But we've also announced now uh, building out our first spokes in Europe. And, and both these markets are are growing rapidly in terms of EV adoption, cell production, EV sales. Uh, and so the recycling need continues to grow. Um, so our, our, our big asset investment, as I said, is, is the hub. But uh, to continue to roll out assets and, and grow the team and grow the company, um, you know, more capital is required as, as we're an asset-based company. Uh, explain uh, the strategy around uh, location, though. Are, are you close to um, are you close to uh, automakers? Are you close to uh, power? Are you close to industry? I mean, where where is the uh, ideal location for when you're building these plants? Yeah, so I'll separate the two. One is on the on the spoke side, the shredding facility. That's the initial intake of batteries or battery materials. So um, you want to be close to either the gigafactories that produce the scrap, high populations, like we built something in Phoenix now, Arizona, which is close to California, high population with big EV penetration, but also population leads to more electronic waste and the like. Um, and similarly in, in Norway or Germany, we're, we're selecting locations uh, where we'll have ease of access to feedstock. Um, on the hub side, there's a number of other considerations. That's a much larger chemical facility, requires a number of inputs, reagents, logistics are much more complex, labor force is different and, and much larger. So we analyze all those factors to find, uh, or we had analyzed all those factors to find the ideal location in, in Rochester, New York. Talk about the deal with Glencore. Yeah, so we we decided uh, some months ago, as we've announced, to to partner with Glencore. One is, of course, an investment partnership where they've um, invested in in Lifecycle, but as a major primary resource provider of um, key battery materials like nickel and cobalt, and us as a secondary provider, we felt that we could uh, combined provide a lot of. Uh, support to our customers for their raw material needs. Um, Glencore is already in, maybe not p directly battery recycling, but other electronic waste recycling. Uh, a lot of black mass or the intermediate material goes to them. So there are a lot of complementary um, avenues and, and common customers that we hope to serve better with, uh, with all their raw material needs. Talk about the whole industry right now, Canal. Um, you must be doing a lot of modeling of uh, the particular amount of supply that is uh, gonna be coming on space right now. Uh, do you see lithium supply ramping up through new technology or are we really constrained right now to the existing miners and developers, um, I guess, using their hard work and their solars? Yeah, I think uh, with lithium, nickel, cobalt, I mean, um, there's a lot of different analysis out there and, and I think, if you benchmark all the announcements and 
uh, thoughts around how many vehicles groups want to produce and, and what raw materials are there. Um, there's a bit of a mismatch. Everyone uh, predicts this deficit, you know, recycling or secondary materials is one way to boost that. But um, there's a lot of factors to consider. One is, you know, um, will everyone be able to ramp up their production of the vehicles that far is the capital there to invest in new resources. We definitely need, I mean, even as a recycler, we recognize you need new primary resources because we're in such a high growth phase for this industry. Um, and then you got to factor in also uh, how will different technologies or new technologies uh, change that equation as they develop and commercialize, whether it's, you know, you have different anode types, silicon or lithium metal, that may change the equation on materials needed on the anode side. And same with different cathode chemistries over time uh, will change how that demand profile looks. How are the uh, chemistries uh, changing uh, for the batteries themselves? It looks like uh, lithium iron phosphate is on the ascendancy. Yeah, I would say in the last 12, 18 months, we've seen um, an, a resurgence and commitment to iron phosphate. Uh, you know, the way I always think of it is that the different chemistries, which will offer different ranges, is kind of like when you would choose a different engine for your vehicle. I mean, the average consumer is not going to say, oh, I want NMC versus LFP. They're going to say, oh, I want 300 mile versus 350 mile range. And so it's definitely a way to help reduce the cost. I mean, lithium prices have skyrocketed, but you're not then exposed to nickel and, and cobalt prices in that chemistry. Um and the, you know, the safety cycle life and the other features of performance are there. Uh, so it's a way for the automakers, I think, to offer different flavors or different versions or models of the same vehicle with different, um, with a different chemistry. Uh, the chemistries don't impact you? No. So we've always taken the approach that any of the lithium ion batteries and battery chemistries we can process, of course, uh, the impact is, you know, what materials are you recovering? So we can recycle, for example, LFP and and still produce the lithium carbonate when once the hub is running um, at a battery grade. Um, obviously, over time, as iron phosphate penetrates the market, or there's a large volume of iron phosphate, uh, you may consider something of a different technology to work with that rather than mixing it with the the system that's designed also to recover nickel and cobalt. Uh, how does the uh, contracts work uh, with uh, Lifecycle then? So um, is, it, um, is, it, is it a function of just uh, how much uh, in material that you're able to produce at the end? Or w w just, uh, just what are the contracts like? Yeah, when, when you're looking to buy feedstock or, or get feedstock, I mean, it's uh, highly variable on the size format. The you know, material contents, obviously a pack percentage-wise versus cathode cutoffs or cathode material is going to have a much different nickel or cobalt content or, or by weight. Um, so all those are factored into it, current commodity prices and, and also geographical markets in different regions. Um, the payment to us or the cost for us to purchase material varies. So um, it's highly variable. I mean, obviously I can't comment on specific uh, contracts, but um, all those factors are considered uh, in the equation. How does uh, recycling complement mining? Uh, I mean, it, it creates another source, as we were talking about earlier, uh, for the materials. Um, there's there's other benefits from an uh, environmental footprint uh, perspective, but also a domestic supply perspective, right? As uh, some of the materials are moving all around the world and may not be available physically uh, in the ground in certain regions, uh, it creates a new source Um in, in that region. But as I said earlier, you can't really have it without mining. Uh, and right now we still need to mine, uh, but it, it uh, adds a complementary side. What, um, how high is uh, the recovery going to be for the recycling industry at large? Um, you know, is it, uh, it, and also does it have some analogs say like the recovery of um, uh, iron ore or copper? Yeah, so from a recovery rate, you know, we're targeted and moving towards uh, up to 95%. I think several of our competitors have all announced numbers in this 90 to 95% range. Uh, I think from an economics point of view, but also an environmental point of view, that's a fair target to have. And, and 
uh, trying to maximize bringing those materials in and closing the loop in the, the supply chain. Uh, last canal, uh, what are the major milestones ahead for Lifecycle? Yeah, so the, the team's working hard towards building the hub, you know, buildings and, and, and the like are going up and uh, um, our first plants in Europe in 2023 as well. Uh, so those are all uh, assets we're executing on and, and everyone's focused on on those major milestones, I think, in the upcoming year. Canal, thank you very much for speaking with Kiko. Yeah, thank you for having me. He's Canal Falfer. He is a Chief Strategy Officer at Lifecycle. My name is Michael McRae, and you're watching Kiko Money.